Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to this seminar on lessons learned from South Sudan, where Hilde Frafro Jonsson will uh, give a presentation. She served as a um, special representative to the UN Secretary General in South Sudan from 2011 to 2014. Uh, she also played a, a key role in the negotiations that led to the comprehensive peace agreement between the SPLM slash A and Sudan in 2005. Uh, she's also been the uh, Minister um, of International Development in, in Norway and a uh, Member of Parliament and an executive or Deputy Executive Director of UNICEF. So I take it that most of you are familiar with her. Um, as um, discussant today, we have Øystein Rolandsen, who is Senior Researcher at PRIO. Um, Amongst other things, he is an expert on uh, viol political violence and democratization uh, in Eastern Africa and the Horn of Africa, as well as the history and current affairs of South Sudan and Sudan. And he runs a blog, uh, Monitoring South Sudan. So I'll just leave the floor to Hilda, and then Eisten will offer his comments afterwards. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Almost good afternoon. Yeah, it is good afternoon, actually. Um, good to see all of you. Um, and so what uh, uh, I thought I should do um, is to use this opportunity to talk about the lessons learned from UNMIS. So it's going to be very much of a specific uh, talk around protection of civilians and the last crisis. But I'm happy in the discussion later to cover broader issues. Huh? So. That's, that's really uh, an opportunity for all of us. So just to say that uh, we don't have to rule out all these other issues, uh, we, can, we can get back to them um, in the discussion. But thank you very much uh, to Nupi for uh, inviting me uh, to address you today. And it is also a welcome opportunity for me since I very recently um, finished my tenure as the Special Representative of the Secretary General to the United Nations in South Sudan and in charge of UNMIS. And of course, um, this was the latest chapter for me in a career-long engagement with the different peoples of Sudan and South Sudan. Um, an opportunity also to reflect on uh, what I will say is a terrible chapter uh, in the, for the world's uh, youngest uh, nation. I'll cover uh, a section around opening the gates and protection of civilians in the context of the crisis. And there, then I'll move to issues related to protection of civilians within the bases. Uh, and then I'll have a few thoughts about the way forward uh, and lessons learned uh, uh, at the end. Firstly, on uh, the first, uh, which is the most critical experience that we had was, of course, um, on the 15th of December uh, in the evening, when shooting started uh, in Juba, uh, thousands of civilians were fleeing uh, for their lives. Uh, they crowded outside the gates uh, of UNMIS, uh, two bases, uh, both uh, the one close to the airport and the one at Jebel, for those who are familiar with Juba, which is further away uh, at the, in the vicinity of town. And the following morning, uh, thousands of people were there. Uh, within a few hours, almost 10,000 people uh, where uh, then uh, crowded around the gates, we opened the gates. I took that decision in the morning. Um, and within a very short time frame, we had all 10,000 inside both bases. Uh, we gave them protection from what we will call uh, an unspeakable violence that first gripped the city of Juba uh, with targeted killings uh, sweeping through the neighborhoods of the capital. Um, and we do believe uh, that uh, this decision also helped stem the cycle of killings that was actually spiraling out of control. It was very clear that the way the violence took hold of the city, it was out of control. Um, and if the ethnic killings and the fighting had continued unabated, it could have had untold consequences. 
The gravity and the scale of the atrocities committed from both sides eventually have been thoroughly documented in a human rights investigation report that AMIS released on the 8th of May, uh, covering um, all the violations that took place from the onset of the crisis on December 15 and onwards. Of course, a number of violations have taken place also after that, and uh, the team is continuing to investigate. But as the violence then spread out of Juba and northeast across the country, um, civilians were in the crossfire. And UN base after UN base opened its gates. Um, a total of nine, uh, and actually at, at, at a certain point in time, it was 10-11, uh, where we um, gave refuge to civilians. The numbers swelled. And as the forces took and retook control of towns and state capitals, civilians also from respective ethnic backgrounds, depending on who was holding which town when, fled to the bases. So the numbers soon multiplied. Um, and if you look at Bentu and Malakal, two critical towns, one in Unity State, the other in Upper Nile State, uh, changed hands repeatedly, as many as 12 times, six times each, uh, in the ebb and flow of a battle. So the destruction was almost total. Civilians of various ethnic backgrounds then fled to the compounds of Anmis each time uh, and f moved in and out. And as people moved in and out of our bases, depending on who had control of that particular location, we consistently accepted them. Uh, periodically, there were accusations that we were protecting one ethnicity and not the other. It is not true. We consistently protected any civilian that was outside the base asking for protection. Today, still, uh, many, many months into, actually nine, ten months into the crisis, 100,000 civilians are still uh, being uh, in refuge inside unmissed bases in South Sudan. And this is unprecedented, not only in the history of South Sudan, it is also unprecedented in the history of the United Nations and of, of international peacekeeping. This has never happened before. There has been incidents of a few hundred, some ten, uh, tens and, and 100 and 200 civilians, but never in this, uh, at this uh, scale. And we should also not forget that the current figures do not include those that came and left from the POC sites. We call them the protection of civilian sites, but they are actually within the bases. So when I use the term POC sites, it's basically within the bases of UNMIS. Uh, so we have done, we did some numbers after five months. Uh, we calculated that well in excess of one million person days of protection was, were prov was provided by, by, by UNMIS. So depending on how you calculate, it's, it's a very significant number. How many people's lives were saved, it's difficult to tell, but most likely tens of thousands of lives. And since then, um, the establishment of, of UNMIS, and I'll revert more to, to, to those protection issues later, but since the establishment of UNMIS in 2011, the protection of civilians has been a core part of the mandate of the mission, and it has been guided by a POC strategy, a protection of civilian strategy that we um, instituted. It follows three tiers. The first tier is basically prevention. It's assisting and, assist, uh, and advising government on protection issues, capacity building of South Sudanese counterparts, it's conflict mitigation and prevention, negotiations, etc. Tier two is basically the physical protection. It's deterring violence through deployment and patrols in high-risk areas, and also to engage to protect civilians under imminent threat. The third tier basically is the protective environment. It's establishing and maintaining a protective environment for vulnerable civilians, very much in cooperation with our human rights colleagues, as well as a collaboration with the protection cluster on the humanitarian side. So those three tiers uh, are included in the protection of civilian strategy, and it follows the broad strategy that, uh, and the guidelines that peacekeeping operations are, are, are running all over the world. Prior to the crisis, we had significant protection challenges, and I think those of you who follow Jonglei, so and who follow South Sudan would also remember Jonglei and the many incidents that took place there. Uh, huge challenges. For South Sudan, 60% of its territory is basically inaccessible for six to eight months by road during the rainy season. So huge logistical challenges. And I'm afraid those challenges related to the protection of civilians in the mandate, that they were grossly underestimated 
um, from the outset uh, of the planning of the mission. And this is something that uh, I think needs to be part of a lessons learned exercise in, in, in the UN. It grossly, grossly underestimated. So with the very limited troop numbers that we had and the severity of what we call the mobility crisis, because we also had problems with mobility, the mission was overstretched and faced very serious limitations in, relate, in relation to physical protection of civilians under threat. Nevertheless, we did deliver on several occasions. Um, in Pibo, which is in Zhongle State, uh, we helped prevent an attack um, from killing thousands of civilians in 2011, 2012, December, January. Hundreds were killed, unfortunately, but not thousands. And through the, also foot patrols later to secure a protective environment to vulnerable civilians. This was later in the same area in 2013. But as I mentioned, significant challenges on physical protection for civilians under threat. Hence, given the operational constraints we had, relatively more of the efforts of the mission were on conflict mitigation, prevention and resolution trying to prevent things from happening rather than waiting and engaging at the, uh, at the later stage. So it was through demonstrating presence and deterrence that we did that with troops uh, and with also political engagement. This then changed dramatically uh, in December last year. So this is then the time of the crisis where we dramatically shifted the focus from prevention and conflict mitigation to direct response. And given the vast knowledge of the audience here, I'm not going to go through what happened on the 15th of December. You all know the political crisis, etc. So I'll not dwell on that. But I want to just emphasize one important thing because there's a lot of discussion about this in particular in circles of diplomacy and Africanist, Africanist studies. Significant attempts were made to avert the crisis in December. Um, more than a year, uh, more than 12 months before uh, the violence, processes of dialogue and reconciliation within the SPLM, the ruling party, were pushed by the leadership. I was in dialogue with them. Uh, they had committees trying to resolve their differences. They didn't succeed. In the months before the crisis, all the way from July on to December, we had regional uh, leaders that were pushed to engage. And we had both Ethiopians, Kenyans, the ANC from South Africa come and engage. But it was all in vain. Uh, they could not succeed in sorting out the problems. So while we knew a crisis was then likely and violence could happen, could happen, it came still sooner than expected and definitely at a scale, a scope and a speed that no one expected. Um, the speed and the scale and the scope of violence and killings. So on my side, uh, I as an SRSG were part of all these efforts. But in early December, I also engaged with both sides, in particular after the press conference on 6 December, for those who are following this very much in detail, where there was a press conference of the critical voices of the SPLM leadership uh, criticizing the president, which was a kind of trigger also. Um, but also uh, during the night between the 15th and 16th of December, I was on the phone all the time trying to uh, get uh, people to, to stop fighting and, and call for calm among the forces. But the speed and the scope and the scale of the violence um, just uh, took off um, and at a level I think unheard of in South Sudanese history. ANMIS did have previous experience in sheltering civilians fleeing violence, both in Pibo, um, in Zhongle State and in Wau, in Western Bergal State in 2012. We learned lessons and we developed what we call in our lingo standard operating procedures uh, for the SOPs. So we also did not want to repeat painful experience of the United Nations in its own history when people have been uh, den denied entry to bases and been killed. But these 2012 incidences were merely a taste and solely that of what was to come. Uh, nothing really could have prepared us as a mission for the challenges that uh, followed um, the killings and the violence, the scale and the magnitude, both of the crisis and the devastation. It should go, the, though, without saying that protection of civilians is, enduring, uh, is the enduring sovereign responsibility of the government. It is the government's responsibility always to protect its own civilians. And um, they cannot and should not be allowed to shirk this duty. However, when governments are unable or unwilling 
To provide such protection, peacekeeping operations must help ensure that civilians are protected. And this is why we engaged um, from Anmi's side. And where a conflict then rapidly escalates with little to no warning, uh, at least at that scale, and it affects several million people, the role of peacekeepers in protecting civilians can also be called into question. So the question is, why did Anmis not intervene to stop the killings in Juba as the fighting was raging? And I've had some South Sudanese friends of mine asking me this question. And the answer is as simple as it is frustrating. We had only two companies, in military terms, a very limited number, um, in the capital, and each was devoted basically to protect the premises of Anmis, the bases. They were not uh, infantry uh, uh, equipped uh, in, the, in the way we would have to expect in such a situation. Um, and it was never foreseen, I think, in all our contingency planning, and we had a lot, even in the most significant worst case scenario, that fighting at this scale would break out in Juba. Our forces were concentrated elsewhere because the worst case scenarios were linked to Zhongle and, and other states where we saw the most significant number of civilians potentially be under greatest threat. Um, our missed capacities in Juba were therefore very, very limited. And we did not also, and this is also critical, have the mandate from the Security Council to intervene between warring parties. Um, and this is critical because it's a difference from DRC, MONUSCO, and also from Mali, where the interventionist part of the mandate is much stronger. We did not have that. And for those who were on the government side who wanted us to uh, join hands with them and fight the rebels, uh, this was a very clear uh, impartiality man mandate, we were not in a position to do that or to any way intervene between warring parties. Nevertheless, civilians were under threat and that was part of our, our mandate. So although limited in number, uh, our available forces immediately moved to where civilians came to seek protection um, and we also moved uh, troops from other parts of the country to Juba. Uh, within 48 hours, we had more troops coming in, but they were still totally inadequate for the challenge we were faced with. So instead of then engaging in the fighting directly, we intervened in a different way. And that intervention um, I, uh, I described for you at the outset, as the fighting raged, we opened our gates and provided protection instead. So that's how tens of thousands of civilians uh, ran into our camps and received this, uh, th this refuge. Despite the challenges, and they have been many, and I'll revert to them uh, in a few minutes, it, in my view, was the right decision to, to take. If I was asked today, did you do the right, would you have taken a different uh, route? I would have said no, I would have taken exactly the same decision today, knowing all the problems we were faced with, and I'll say a little bit about them. Um, I also see this um, as very much linked to what the Secretary General has launched um, a few months prior to this, which was the Rights Upfront Initiative, which is to give priority to people's rights, basically, uh, and rights of protection. I also believe that uh, we helped, through this action, to prevent the ethnic violence from spinning totally out of control. And I think our South Sudanese friends that are in the audience would be able to say a little bit more about what could have happened if that action hadn't been taken. Um, so, we had the mandate to protect civilians and to do so proactively and to do so pro robustly. And let me say a little bit about some concrete examples of how this was, be was done beyond the bases, beyond the exact opening of the gates. So in Malakal and in Bentiu, when civilians were hiding in hospitals and churches and mosques, and quite a number of civilians did, um, they thought they were safe because traditionally in Sudan and South Sudan, one has not entered into these spaces. Civilians have usually been protected in these locations, but they were not. So there were attacks in all of these locations. So more than uh, on several occasions, while our forces intervened, more than 400 civilians were extracted and rescued from these locations in Bentiu under fire while the fire was, was, was on. A safe corridor at that time brought more than a thousand people into safety, and into safety meant into our base. 
Um, in Malakal, more than 1,500 people uh, that were hiding uh, in several churches were also brought to safety in the same way. We managed to get them transported and in some cases protect the route uh, through the presence of our forces so they could be able to get into the base. Um, so these are concrete examples that we did not only open the gates, we were also intervening uh, in trying to rescue civilians that were under threat. Now, there are still questions raised in some quarters uh, as to why the mission did not do more. And they're pointing to, uh, at the time, uh, around a million IDPs that were uh, also on the move in South Sudan. Now it's 1.8. Um, so what about the civilians elsewhere? Protecting 100,000 is good, but what about the one point something, 1.5, 1.9, 1.8, who also fled the fighting? Well, these IDPs have mostly fled to safety along traditional routes in South Sudan. Unfortunately, the history of South Sudan is full of civilians fleeing from fighting. So they know where to go, and in very many cases, they crossed the Nile, and in that way got away from the, the, the battle and from the fighting. Um, so they went into the bush across the Nile or into other locations where basically the humanitarians were the primary responders. And in these, from these civilians, we did not get requests of force protection for those bases. They were, or those camps rather, they were okay with the humanitarian uh, uh, support. Uh, but they also needed much more humanitarian support, which is a, a different story. Uh, but in terms of force protection, um, we did protect those who did come and seek our, uh, our support and help. Now, of course, the Security Council, in Security Council Resolution 2155, um, reiterated and expanded the protection of civilians mandate of UNMIS. Uh, this is the mandate uh, which came into motion by end May uh, and was also uh, one of the triggers for me also to to uh, finish my job because I was coming in as an SRSG on a, on a different mandate. When the mandate changed and I'd completed three years of contract, it was time for me to hand over to, to another uh, colleague. And so basically the new mandate uh, included also an increase in troop levels to 12,500 um, and also an even stronger protection of civilians mandate. Uh, this increase is critical for and the force to be able to be more proactive and robust outside the bases. With the numbers we had, it was virtually impossible um, because of the constraints um, we had. During my tenure, some six months after the council initially had authorized an increase to 12,500, the exact same number, we still had only 8,261 troops on the ground after five months. We had one-fifth of the surge delivered five months into the crisis. So it shows how slowly the, the, the deployment uh, went. The key for that was that the Security Council chose the so-called Intermission Corporation, UN lingo for borrowing f troops from others. Yeah? And so the main source of additional troops was to get troops from other missions. And that was a much longer and more difficult process than, than we uh, foresaw. And so that was the reason why uh, the deployments went so, so slowly. Now, of course, more forces have come in, still not at the expected level, and minor level, but uh, the contributions also from IGAD countries, from the Ethiopians, uh, came in quite quickly, but there's still troops uh, uh, on the wait. But for these troops and forces to be able to respond uh, in a timely manner, the mission also needs other equipment. Force multipliers, riverine units, mobility assets. This is another critical issue for them to be able to deliver on the mandate. The third issue, so it's the numbers, it's the equipment, and the third issue is their ability to act on the mandate in a consistent and robust manner. So those three elements need to be in place for civilians to be protected far outside the bases now. Now, a significant number of systemic issues for the UN have been exposed uh, in this context and during this crisis for us. One, the problems related to surge of troops. They come in much slower than the Security Council was expecting and with mixed results when under the intermission uh, cooperation. Secondly, additional military cap capacities such as force multipliers, riverine units, etc., even night fly equipment, uh, also very difficult to mobilize. 
thirdly, and I haven't talked about that, but it will be uh, coming out of my, my next few points, uh, the surge of formed police units, formed meaning armed police units, not least including women, a big issue, um, has been extremely hard, and I'll revert to this a bit later, and the Security Council has also mandated a limited number. And uh, finally, the surge also of civilian capacities and not least human rights investigation capacity has been an additional issue for us. So these systemic issues have been revealed and they of course are more exposed in situations of urgent crisis, such as in South Sudan, than in slow, low intensity conflict. So we have been really, really seeing the, the challenges of the system. And we cannot be at all, on, in all places at all times, so this is also linked to early warning. So protection efforts need to be prioritized in line with early warning and early warning instruments. And we had pretty good uh, early warning systems, but of course now the situation is different. I also need pretty advanced early warning equipment to know and predict um, the lines of battle and, the, and where potential threats against civilians will be. So this is part of the new POC strategy that the mission is working on, which will address these new realities. <laughs> but, and this issue I, I mentioned initially, it also depends on how the contingents operationalize and implement their own mandate. The rules of engagement, I, very much this is uh, linked to traditions in different armies, to cultural diversity. Um, and of course now with regional forces coming in, maybe there will be um, uh, a more robust uh, approach, we will see. Uh, but it is absolutely critical for the force to ensure a significantly uh, robust response across all contingents and that this is applied consistently. And so hopefully uh, we will not see a major increase in fighting with the dry season. If that happens, this is going to be very essential. So all three issues need to be captured uh, for the mission to be able to deliver. Then let me move from protection of civilians outside to the inside of the bases, and I'm, uh, I will be a bit quicker uh, on that front. The earliest days and weeks of the crisis, uh, we had to change the mindset, the po posture and the approach of, of the whole mission. One of the biggest challenges we had was that the humanitarians evacuated a huge number of people out of South Sudan during the most intense period. At the same time, we got civilians into our bases and we only had water. So a very, very significant challenge. Uh, and it led to a situation where the mission became the responder of last resort. So we had the UN peacekeeping mission actually doing humanitarian operations for quite a while. And in Bo in particular for weeks, because in Bo, even our civilian staff had to be evacuated. It was extremely dangerous and only the military were, were there. And they, they, the challenges of feed, giving civilians in their bases water and then trying to transport food, getting it from WFP to distribute, it was a huge uh, challenge and, and very significant um, uh, major effort. A Herculean effort basically was was made by our military during this time, and I know it's it's really uh, as we say to swear in the church in Norway that the military does this, but it basically was a last resort. If they hadn't, people would have died. So we had a, a fantastic team that pulled this off, and then the humanitarians started to come in. So the other very important lessons learned apart from the protection of civilians issues like as a special cluster, are, is the lessons learned around the humanitarian response. We've done a unique, issue, unique effort in, in UNMIS, which is to have the humanitarians operate within our bases at the protection of civilian sites. I don't think anywhere else in the world you'll see MSF and ICRC work within the peacekeeping mission base. But they're actually doing that, and they're doing that still. And the reason basically is, this is the humanitarian imperative, and the humanitarian imperative of saving people's lives trumps everything else. Even if you don't like it, you do it, because otherwise people will die. And so what we did then, after the humanitarians started to come back, and we saw this was going to be a longer term uh, situation, uh, what we basically did was to establish a structure and a framework on the cooperation between the mission and the humanitarians that could work for both parties. So I think it might have helped that I had a background from being in charge of humanitarian operations in, uh, in UNICEF. So I knew the mindset quite well. And so basically we established a firewall 
between the mission and the humanitarians, which made it uh, possible for the humanitarians to link to a third party and not directly with the military or units in the mission. This is very important for impartiality and neutrality for humanitarian operations, as I'm sure some of you are, are fully aware of. So to cater for these principles, we established a structure of cooperation that made it possible for them to feel a little bit of the necessary distance uh, so that they could work within the base under a humanitarian um, uh, imperative and under the humanitarian coordinator without being tainted by military operations. Uh, but this was critical. And we actually had daily meetings twice a day that included the humanitarians from the onset of the crisis. The first meetings were on the 16th of December. And it was a crisis management meetings that took place throughout the crisis. A uh, huge effort uh, was made, and I think together we have made headway in how missions and humanitarians really can operate and work together. It's a totally new way and totally breaking new ground in the UN system. So not only opening the gates, but also that uh, cooperation. I thought it was important to highlight. And let me also say that the humanitarians really did a fantastic job, and they still do. Uh, cholera, of course, came uh, as a huge outbreak in Juba. If you, don't, if, you, if you want all the crisis to happen at once, you, of course, need the last one in addition, which was a huge cholera outbreak. And we were very worried that our, our bases would be the origins of the, of the outbreak. They were not. We were also worried because people were basically wading in mud because of the rainy season. Um, and uh, the bases are extremely muddy. Are very, very, the sphere standards are 10 times what the IDPs in, in South Sudan are living in within the bases. So they actually should have had 10 times more space. I mean, they're living like this. It's terrible. And in mud deep like this, up to your thighs many times. And so what I said to the government who were blaming me for, for protecting people that were there just for fun, I told them you're not, they didn't say fun, but uh, that I was protecting them um, and they could have been elsewhere, they were just there for political reasons. And I responded, they're not there for fun. I mean, you don't live in mud like this if, if you have an option, if you have an alternative. That's not a choice you make. And you don't want your kids to wade in mud like this. You really don't. So terrible conditions, uh, but they have pulled it off. So cholera was, of course, our biggest fear. But we managed to to avert it, and the cholera epidemic went off with huge outbreaks uh, many, many places, and still the bases were kept with zero incidents and zero infected until the first ones came. But they're still very, very uh, limited and few compared to the rest of, of the country. So a fantastic uh, effort has been made by, by them. So um, the... The lessons learned on this cooperation, I think it's not that this should be replicated all over, but it's a sign of how you can operate under emergency and crisis in a way that is conducive to both parties uh, within the, the international architecture. And I think that's an important uh, issue. The final issue I wanted to just say a few words about um, uh, before I sum up, uh, basically is the issues of what then? When you have 100,000 people in your bases, what then? Uh, security within the sites have, beyond the hygienic humanitarian operation issues, have been maybe the biggest uh, additional challenge. And it's not an easy decision to make to keep people in this situation. And of course, uh, it's, uh, a, what happens in society uh, in terms of all sorts of people that are there, of course, moves into the bases, no? You don't only have angels in bases either. And of course, the situation that, uh, uh, with these cramped conditions, will eventually lead to increased tensions compared to when they are on the streets. So eventually, security becomes a huge challenge. We had formed police units that were sent in from DRC and other places, but there were still too few, far too few, didn't have enough of their arms, and I mean, huge challenges. So crime, gender-based violence, big issues. Intercommunal violence, big issues. Uh, so the security, we had to use military to do policing tasks within the bases. We had to use all our ANPOL, who were police advisors, were changed into operational executive police officers without a, an executive mandate. And we got additional uh, supplies. Very, very uh, big challenge. 
Um, and of course, um, what also has happened in South Sudan over time is the issues around security for IDPs that leave the bases because they need to go sometimes to collect firewood, to get um, s supplies, food. Of course, is harassment, but also sexual violence, and it's increasing. So these are huge challenges that we have had to take on. And of course, um, the issues around uh, sexual violence in conflict are mounting. Uh, and in the last briefing of the SRSG on sexual violence in conflict that was in the Security Council last week, or was it the week before, she has pointed out that, the, that this is a, a terrible situation. So clearly it is escalating and therefore should be a very significant priority for the mission going forward and for also the women protection advisors that we have deployed there uh, in, the, uh, in the context also of the monitoring mechanism that needs to be in place as well. So we have huge challenges around the most vulnerable, the children and the women in situations like these, not only security generally, but also particular protection challenges for the most vulnerable um, of the IDPs. So when you see new stories coming, uh, please be aware that uh, there will be stories coming of, you know, if not a gang rape, at least more rapes going on in unmissed bases, etc. Uh, it's my colleague Ellen that will have to take uh, care of that media-wise, but please be aware that all the efforts possible has been made by all the actors on the ground. And we have also asked for, and I did, and she is, more resources in terms of formed police units to help uh, alleviate the situation. They are yet to come and yet to be fully mandated. So it's very important to know this. It's not something that we foster. It is something that is forced upon us by the, the circumstances. Um, so I think it's also important when these bad stories come, and eventually they, they will come, that you, we also remember that the alternative uh, is that their lives were lost. It's not that they, 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 they basically could be protected if we had more resources, but we need to remember that they're there because their, their lives have been saved by the same UN that is now being criticized. So please keep that in mind when these debates start coming. Um, but of course, for all of these people, the most dignified thing is to go home, is to live in peace, is to live in your home area and to be able to, to live in a, a sustainable uh, environment. For these people, they are now too afraid to, to leave. They are too afraid uh, to uh, go out of the gates. Many are, are not even going one step out um, and they are not trusting that they will be protected. So the discussion that is now very important is how do we foster an environment that can permit their return? One, of course, is a comprehensive peace agreement, a political solution. That will give them much more of confidence that this is moving in the right direction. The second, of course, is communication from the government, from the government to really embrace the people that are in the basis and say they are part of South Sudanese society, we want you to be an integrated part of our neighborhoods, please don't be afraid, we'll put all the measures we can in place. So per public communication, not to, to, um, to be antagonistic, but the opposite, being inclusive, embracing um, the people. And a third, a very, very critical issue is security on the ground to help build neighborhoods that, where they can feel safe. And in this regard, neither the security forces nor the police are trusted. The only trusted partner is the UN. And that's why I, in my tenure, during my tenure, pushed for a stronger mandate for the police to be able to be a third party that can help build the capacity and monitor the situation on the ground so that when IDPs leave the camp and are moving back into their neighborhoods, they would know that there's UN presence there and they will feel safer. To date, we have not yet received such a mandate. Uh, it is basically now coordination between the police of South Sudan and, and uh, the UN uh, police. And uh, we'll see whether um, the Security Council will grant a stronger mandate that includes police cooperation that, of course, implements also the policy on human rights due diligence, which is an essential part of, of this. So this is a very, very critical factor going forward. Otherwise, I think the IDPs will remain in unmissed spaces for years and years to come, and it's not sustainable. So this has to be addressed. Uh, and so we need to, need to see that reality check 
uh, also internationally and discuss with our human rights colleagues how can we make sure that this is being done in a way that also caters for, for those concerns. So the lessons learned to, uh, on the peacekeeping side uh, is, is basically these three clusters. So the protection of civilians externally uh, opening the gates. Secondly, the cooperation and the unique uh, uh, challenge, the unique uh, development of a structure that we made with our humanitarian colleagues and between the two. And the third one uh, are the issues around how can we foster a return uh, so that this is not a situation that lasts for, for very much longer. Uh, and uh, those are the, the kind of three lessons learned. And finally, uh, just a, a, a reflection on the way forward for South Sudan. Because these are now systemic challenges that I've highlighted for the UN as a system um, and that need to be addressed. There is a review that is being launched by the Secretary General. The review panel is going to be announced quite soon, which will look into peace operations um, across the board in the UN, but also including some of these systemic issues we, we expect. The terms of reference we, we are waiting for, but this is going to be very important and these issues can easily be fed into that process. I believe NUPI is also preparing um, a process and of work in this regard uh, that I think the ministry has, has helped uh, sponsor. So the way forward for South Sudan, I think at independence, the establishment of UNMIS was actually reflecting the mandate to help the build and support this new nation. Um, and nation building was at the heart and state building was at the heart of the mandate. I do believe that some progress was made um, during the first two and a half years of independence. But now the nation building project has been set back, in my view, decades, decades. And while the worst famine may now have been averted, we hope, um, almost half of the South Sudanese population faces hunger or food insecurity within the next few months. We're going towards the hunger gap very soon. 1.8 million are IDPs, hundreds of thousands are refugees, and if someone had told me in 2011 that we would see South Sudanese citizens fleeing to Khartoum for safety, I would have said, you're joking. But it happened. Very, very many fled to, South, to, to Sudan and to Khartoum. Tens of thousands of people have been killed. So this is, unfortunately, a man-made disaster. And the whole, in my view, the whole SPLM leadership must take collective responsibility for what happened and for this. Nobody has any excuse. And they all contributed to this, and in my view, they all, play, they all played with fire. Now they need to stop blaming others and pointing fingers at each other. Now is the time to acknowledge responsibility and look at the way forward. How can we get back on track? South Sudan needs a completely new start with transformational reforms in a number of areas, in transparency and governance, um, sound financial management, we haven't even touched on the issue of corruption, uh, in the justice sector, the security sector, making sure that the state becomes the protector of civilians, not the predator. Very important. This can only be implemented through robust political leadership. But above all, a new start is only possible with a genuine and comprehensive process of national reconciliation and healing. A kind of band aid solution at the negotiating table will not succeed. It is much deeper than that and it has to be addressed as such. This kind of deep process is urgently needed because it's a unification of a deeply divided country that is now uh, the main task. And for this process to succeed, accountability for the grave violations and the atrocities committed is also absolutely fundamental. If the accountability is not there, people will not trust the process. It will be a very long journey, but it's fundamental for building this new nation. So the international community, we are here. We cannot take this journey for them, this long journey. They have to do it all themselves, um, but we can support. Many say that crisis is opportunity. This is absolutely the worst crisis South Sudan has ever seen. This is therefore also the greatest test to the South Sudanese leadership, the greatest test they have ever faced. The test of putting their country and their people first. The test of saving the country and not themselves. So far, it seems that they are just delaying the difficult decisions. At least if you monitor the EGAD process, 
the indications are not very good. However, there is still some time, and let us still hope they will pass the test. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Hilda, for uh, painting such a vivid picture of the situation in South Sudan and also for uh, shedding light on so many important issues, both in relation to the protection of civilians and peace operations in general. Um, I'll give the floor to Eystein now before I open up for questions from you. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Nupi, for inviting me here. I'm very happy to be here and have the opportunity to discuss this issue. I think it's uh, actually commendable that you are focusing on a more narrow topic than more generally about everything that's wrong with South Sudan, because that tends to become a discussion about everything and nothing. So focusing on this issue of uh, protection of civilians, about the role of UNMIS, uh, should give us the opportunity to have a very constructive discussion here. Uh, today and thank you for Hil uh, to Hilda for this uh, very lucid, uh, comprehensive but still relatively brief uh, presentation of uh, uh, the issue. Uh, we we had opportunity to discuss uh, many of these issues at different instances earlier, uh, but uh, it's great to have the opportunity now to talk to a lot more people about this. It is, of course, a very a uh, tragic situation, as I, I think uh, was very clear from what uh, Hilda said. Um, and it is also at the same time a very important test of uh, many of the core uh, practices, uh, of the core principles of the United Nations, um, especially in this type of complex emergencies or civil war uh, settings, um, as we have in this uh, situation. And um, There are several issues here that are worth commenting upon. One is about the, is the possibility for an operation like UNMIS to actually uh, protect <laughs> civilians in South Sudan in general. Uh, the other one is uh, the decision that Hilda has been mentioning now about opening uh, the gates uh, uh, of the UNMIS compounds. Uh, and finally, of course, what to do now. Um, uh, and Seen from a more analytical perspective, one of the interesting things that Hilda brings up is the question of the spatiality uh, of uh, protection. Because it, what, what type of protection a civilian would need depends very much on where they are. Whether they are inside a camp, whether they are in a so-called safe zone, or if they are actually in a zone where active combat is taking place. Uh, and this is something that needs to be included in the way that uh, UNMIS are um, both uh, uh, forming their mandates, but also in the way that they are um, developing their procedures. So uh, first, what, what can UNMIS do to those outside the camps? It is correct, as Hilde were saying, that uh, there has been, uh, that they have been focusing on Zhonglei. Uh, UNMIS have been trying to uh, address these issues of communal violence, of local clashes, of minor uh, rebellions. But on the other hand, if you look at the statistics, if you look at the thousands of people that died every year, they have not managed to completely fulfill uh, this role. And it's actually, um, from my traveling around in South Sudan, and now I'm just conveying what others are saying, people are in general very disappointed with what capacity UNMIS have had to prevent uh, prevent violence and their capacity to uh, uh, provide security, especially in rural areas. And that kind of brings the question now, when we have this new situation, even with the surge, even with 5,000 new troops, what more, uh, what is possible uh, to do? Uh, and here, uh, the, you, you're talking a lot about robustness. Uh, and with robustness, we uh, are talking about uh, better equipped, better trained, uh, more, uh, let's say, potent forces. And up to now, I think that the UNMIS has been balancing on the knife edge when it comes to the use of force. As far as I know, there has, if there has ever been any incident of UN 
troops firing on any South Sudanese, it has been suppressed or it has not been made a big issue about. But if the idea now is that the UN is going to go out more actively uh, to try uh, to uh, intervene in situations where they see that uh, what is at this time defined as civilians are going to be um, uh, protected, that will potentially imply actually getting involved in firefights, getting involved in uh, conducting violence on behalf of enemies. And that will raise a lot of new questions and will uh, make the situation uh, rather different. It will be a very different operation from what it has been now, which despite all the efforts has mostly been a monitoring mission, a mission to try to see what is happening, try to address issues, try to facilitate processes, work behind the scenes, but not uh, be uh, relatively intervention, interven uh, intervening very much. So, so this is the question, what lies in this new robustness? What will be the consequences? And uh, as we also know, when we look at the other side, uh, oh, who are the combatants here? Uh, we know that there are a lot of unorganized groups that have been mobilized, especially on the SPLM in opposition side, that for many purposes would be defined as civilians. So will we now have the Udemis start to engage civilians in firefights to protect other civilians? Or, or what will be the rules of engagement here? It will be extremely uh, complicated. Uh, so uh, it would be interesting to hear Hilda's reflections on some of these uh, future challenges. Um, this, um, uh, but uh, I think from, uh, uh, to welcome, when, when you have tens of thousands of people standing outside the gates of uh, uh, the Unimis uh, compounds, you, you have no other opportunity than to uh, opening and try to do what you can to save them. That is uh, obvious, and I think that was the absolute right decision for the Unimis to do. But as Hilde now has uh, pointed to, when this is going on for a long period, a new situation arises. Because what is actually happening now in these camps is the establishment of a um, makeshift refugee camp. Uh, in the, it's uh, working, but with, then with IDPs inside South Sudan. And, if, uh, and so far, refugee camps have been run outside the borders. And uh, people have been, uh, as many of you humanitarians know, there is a uh, uh, large debate uh, or uh, as long as people stay inside the country, they are this, uh, defined as IDPs and they have certain rights and certain opportunities, but very, very limited compared to those that have crossed the border and are under the protection of the UNHCR and uh, under the mandate of uh, refugees. So, but now some of these exclusive rights seems to now, ha now have been extended to inside the country, to the UNIMIS basis, where uh, also um, we, we must, of course, hope that this uh, conflict will be solved uh, fairly soon. But in the event that it, that doesn't happen, as we have seen in many other places, you have this refugee situation that goes on forever, where people are staying in camps on a very long, uh, for a long, very long period. And would Unimis be the right, uh, or a peacekeeping operators, would they be the right agencies to have the responsibility for these kind of camps? Uh, that, that is the, question that I'm asking. And would at this now, of course, during at the time when the conflict was uh, intense, during the fighting, then their lives were at stake for those that were inside the camps. But what about now? Is, are there any exit strategies? Uh, for how long should, uh, should the people in the Unimis camps be staying there? Is the only alternative for them to return uh, to uh, what uh, is often named as the place of origin? Or are there other options? Uh, is there something else that can be done? There are so many other displaced people in South Sudan. Why, why should these be given this special treatment? And should, then, uh, should they then stay inside South Sudan if their life is at risk in South Sudan? That is just some of the questions that um, would be interesting to ask. And it's also a question of the safety. Uh, in these uh, compounds. If one of the warring parties, for one or another reason, decides to make a focused attack on these camps, 
will the enemies be capable of protecting them? Um, that is uh, some of the questions that is coming up. Uh, but, uh, and I think that this is an important test case for the UN in general. Uh, and I think it uh, will be debated by uh, academics and practitioners for a long time uh, to come. Uh, and I hope that we will be able to start this uh, debate uh, right now. So thank you for now. Thank you very much, Aisten. I'll ask the two of you to stand over there, and um, I'll open up for questions and comment from you. And uh, Lee will hand out the microphone for the people who want to talk. Um, Hilde, would you like to comment on uh, Aisten's uh, comments first, and then Just a couple yeah. of issues, and then I think we. Uh, I'll invite a couple of people in the audience also. <laughs> uh, First, uh, on the issues around um, uh, around the possibility of UNMIS to do protection prior to the crisis, um, Einstein touched on that. Uh, if I can ask uh, Peter Linkvist, who was the chief of, of staff uh, in UNMIS during that time and in the first part of the crisis, he, if you can comment a little bit on that afterwards and maybe also whatever you want, it would be helpful because it will say a little bit about military capacities. Uh, I don't want to go into detail about uh, about the gross uh, gross underestimation of the protection challenges, but Pete Petter can do that uh, better than me. Um, but with regard to um, the issues around um, uh, getting the intervention issues you raised uh, and what robustness really means, um, I think the uh, just one comment on that and one comment on the long term, very briefly. Uh, the mandate is not an intervention mandate, so you're very right in pointing out that there are some grey zones here where you can get into very complicated, uh, a very complicated situation on the ground. Um, and I did notice that the new SRSG, uh, Ellen Loy, is saying that there will be a more robust and proactive approach outside the basis on POC, and you will uh, eventually get into these challenges in terms of who's, with, with what and, and, and with which means, can you react? Can you react when? And so this is a, a very, very uh, challenging issue that I'm not the right one at this point in time to give all the answers to. But uh, for those who have military background in the audience, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of helpful to get your your feedback on that too. Uh, on the issues around uh, the long term, just one one brief uh, point. We had numerous discussions, and to be honest, we went around in circles uh, on the issues uh, uh, around uh, uh, movement to places of origin, in particular for, for example, the IDPs in Bor. Now there are only 3,000 new left in the Bodinka territory, and they're pleading uh, for being transported to their home areas. At the same time, the home areas are at this point in time not safe. Uh, and so there's been a huge discussion also between the humanitarians, the mission, I mean, no fights, but just really, really having rounds and rounds and rounds of discussions on what to do, because it is not a sustainable situation. But I wanted to highlight that, um, uh, of course, prior to taking such a decision, you don't have an exit strategy. You just take a decision and you have to deal with the issues as they come. Now, the other exit that, of course, the IDPs themselves want is to, try to go abroad. So in Juba, most of them want to be relocated to Kenya or Uganda. No, I'm sorry, not Uganda, Kenya. Uh, um, but the, the challenge, of course, then is that the UN is not in a position to evacuate people out of a country. Uh, you're in a, you're in with a host nation. And so you have huge challenges that implies that for the government, it's not acceptable that the UN assists people to become refugees in a different country. Um, and so you have also discussions with the government about what to do. So I'm just laying out uh, all the different issues for you for further discussion. It's really from those who have discussed and, dis and worked on humanitarian issues, also huge and complex challenges that one has to deal with and that will be debated. Uh, the next few months. Hey, Peter Lindquist, would you like to, you can have. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for being invited to uh, <laughs> commenting on uh, on a few of the, the issues you've uh, you brought to the table. Uh, 
First of all, uh, Hilda mentioned as one of the prerequisites that need to be in place in order for the military component to uh, to work in uh, in an efficient manner. Uh, we remember she's mentioned um, the force multipliers to be in place. Uh, we need to have, um, in addition to that, uh, also uh, the act, uh, the, the ability to act according to the mandate. Um, this is perhaps one of the most important prerequisites that we will uh, will have to look for uh, in the sense that one thing is to bring a military uh, component on the ground somewhere. Uh, another thing is to see how the military, a military force as such, will uh, act in a deterring manner, uh, whether it's uh, capable of using adequate force when required. Uh, and these are some of the areas that will bring us to what uh, Oestein also mentioned. Um, the fact that this mission has perhaps by many, uh, including myself, uh, been seen as a monitoring, reporting uh, mission. Uh, we're still carrying the legacy of the previous mission, almost with one S. Uh, and in my view, uh, there is nothing uh, in 2155, the new mandate coming in, uh, taking in, uh, taking effect from uh, from May this year, and the previous one, uh, there is nothing that there is nothing changing in the way that we should expect the military troops to do or not do. On the contrary, uh, it's we we have the same rules of engagement. Uh, basically, we have the same military task as well. Uh, the same obligation to protect civilian, but also the same dilemmas. The same dilemmas, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, yes, in some cases, uh, it may be a risk that a military force uh, enforcing the mandate will have to open fire uh, at civilians or will have to be seen as intervening between the two fighting parties. Will it, is this justifiable? Can you defend it uh, by saying that this is uh, protecting or enforcing the mandate? Uh, uh, looking at civilians being under imminent threat of, uh, of force? Probably it is. Uh, in my opinion, uh, there is no way around it. Um, this, this mission has probably, by the, the warring parties, been seen as a scarecrow. You can, you can do pretty much, uh, I wouldn't say what you want, but you can do a lot of things without risking being encountered or faced with a force that has the not only the ability but the will to use actual force, and I think uh, we are we're getting closer and closer to that moment in time, especially when we have twelve thousand five hundred troops on the ground in South Sudan. This this will have to happen, otherwise bringing more troops in will be just counterproductive. I'm not saying that this is going to be easy, because it was also highlighted whenever. It happens whenever uh, UNMIS will somewhere within the area of operations have to open fire to protect civilians in a justifiable manner according to the mandate, according to the rules of engagement. We will have to be prepared that it will be a kickback and it will also be a kickback that can hit the entire mission. This is a, a mission that has had a tradition of opening its gates, working not only for the people but with the people, working closely, uh, let's say, um, um, integrated in the local communities as well. This may have to change uh, when, uh, when and if the force will start using, using military force, using firepower to enforce the mandate. But I do see it uh, at this stage that it will, it will have to happen one way or another. Then I'll take some questions from you. Uh, if you identify yourself before you ask the question, it would be good. And Lee will bring our microphone. Uh, Bolwek, Ambassador of South Sudan. Uh, <coughs> first, I have a number of questions, but some may be common. Uh, let, let me thank Helda and all Norwegians who are here for their determination to help people of South Sudan. They have been helping, as she related earlier, in the CPA role and, and even in 1972 agreement. Uh, my question 
is personal and I represent the government of South Sudan as well. Uh, my first question is, why did the conflict of 15 December 2013 shock all South Sudanese and our friends and Troika members? Why did it become a shock despite the, the effort that he has related? <coughs> uh, I think nobody has answered this clearly. Number two, uh, there is no a clear definition of what has happened. It is always said to be a shocking conflict or sometimes ethnic cleansing. What it is, was it a political thing? Was it a coup? Uh, I'm asking this because the way it has spread within two days, <clears throat> it could not be the way it is explained that, you know, it was ethnic cleansing and all this. The, the root causes underlying these are not understood. And I think it is good for Norway to keep its international credentials that they don't always, you know, they don't always enter into affairs of others. They are there as partners. They have the best heart for, for everybody else, despite this small country. And I think we can talk up to tomorrow about the root causes of why the conflict has gone to that stage. <clears throat> Number three, there are IDPs in Sudan, in South Sudan, you know. If, if, if Pelda and the rest who have been in South Sudan can agree with me, there are 5,000 in Warab from <clears throat> Unity State and maybe a number of others in Lakes. There's no UN there as far as I know. But how do they live there? How are they living there? That is the most important question to me. And it can explain exactly this is a political conflict. It has nothing to do with the common people, which he alluded to it, that... The SPLM leadership has to be blamed. And I'm not here to defend Salpakir as the president. Uh, <clears throat> number four, which I disagree with Elda a little bit, he said the IDPs in Yuba and maybe the three affected states don't trust the police of South Sudan. I think, um, I must say, Elda did not update their information about this because a good number of IDPs are coming up coming out from uh, from Yuba camp. And I can testify to some extent with that. So really, it is still a social media disinformation, but things are a little bit different. It is how we recognize where they are and we take from there, that is important. And number four, I think UN, Troika, which are France, Norway, UK, and US, their approach to issues of South Sudan, I don't want to talk about Africa, is not accurate because sometimes they depend on individuals. Uh, sometimes <clears throat> they disregard the principle of democracy, which is the essence of the world today. Because when this uh, situation arises, there was an elected government. And indeed, I must say, as South Sudanese, once we disregard the process where things are, and we just change the government the way we want, there is no end to that. Because we are powerful tribes, and we are weak tribes. If you don't make sure that there is a law that binds everybody, it will be a vicious circle. I think my generation will age, and it will continue. And we, 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 we should be convinced that any solution will come from South Sudan. Anything we do should help people of South Sudan and not people who make noise that, you know, the rest of the world will come and change things in South Sudan. It will never happen. Uh, <clears throat> number six, Sudan, you know, what has ignited the conflict in South Sudan it was a routine thing, a change of government, a disagreement in one party. Sudan has reshuffled out the most powerful vice president in Sudan history, Ali Osman and even Dr. Nafe, it did not even cause a single quarrel. Why? Maybe Sudan has that tradition of a little democracy which is not accepted, but it did work. Why should such a little change in South Sudan become a big thing? And it can even ignite such, you know, when she mentioned about that rally which was made by Yagmashar, and the cadres of SPLM that I can mention, 
If I were among them, it would have, I would count myself to have made a biggest mistake because these were two different entities talking publicly and even threatening. It doesn't work. If, 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 it was, if, if we were a European politician, we would have foreseen that what we are doing will ignite a certain situation, and that is irresponsible politics. Uh, my last, I'm, I'm sorry to take a long time, uh, UN has been operating all over the world, but I don't remember how many times have UN succeeded in Africa in particular. And I think I must recognize the role held the plate uh, with their team in the enemies. They have protected the life of civilians. There's no doubt about that. But, you know, talking about UN extending their mandate and doing all this, I don't think South Sudan is no different from Somalia. UN have not succeeded in Somalia, and I think it may not succeed in, in South Sudan if they intervene the way people are pushing it. There, there is a solution, and I must say, there should be a confidence on the process now to peace. It is happening. And we should take from there then just inventing theories and raising emotions which are not, 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 not workable. Thank you very much. If you pass on the microphone to the lady to the right to you. And we'll take one more question before I let you answer. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Anne Kjersti Furuholm from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, thank you very much to Hilde and also from, uh, for um, uh, the representative from PRIO for uh, uh, your comments. Um, I have one question. Oh, I'm sorry, I haven't. Okay, I'm sorry. But uh, anyway. Um, I have one question that goes a little bit outside of the protection of civilian aspect, uh, because I wonder, I mean, uh, there is this upcoming review of UN peace operations, so it will be a very interesting also to hear from you, uh, your reflections upon other aspects of the mandate that might, in a way, at least partly explain, uh, or is, are there deficiencies in the mandate that could help explain why um, <coughs> You were not able, in a way, to uh, prevent uh, the crisis in last December from happening. I mean, could could the UN have been more active in any way? I mean, to support the political process or other aspects. Thank you. If you answer those questions now, then uh, and we'll take another round of questions afterwards. You and uh, yeah, it's on. Um, I think uh, what Peter said uh, stands for itself. Just uh, to just add that I think uh, in a partial comment to, to Eustan also, the population of South Sudan, and I think it's the same in many other African countries when you're talking about uh, whether the UN succeeds or not, is that when they see a UN force coming in under a peacekeeping hat, they think it's hundreds of thousands of troops with um, incredible resources and logistical capability. Also because when you see on the tarmac in Juba, you see all these helicopters, but you don't really know that uh, there's none of them that are attack helicopters. Uh, and there's none of them that can fly into, at least in the case of UNMES, fly into insecure territory. Uh, they didn't want to fly. So, so you have these uh, incredible expectations. And I think whoever you ask, whether it's in South Sudan or elsewhere, nobody will be happy with the performance of a peacekeeping mission because they just don't have the resources and they also will not be able to protect each and every individual in the country. And in the case of South Sudan, of course, you had multiple attacks and intercommunal violence. There was, even with the best early warning system, you wouldn't have been able to fly into that location on time to protect those civilians. And of course, it makes people mad. So it's a very thankless <laughs> job to be in, to be an SRSG wherever you are, because I think you will constantly have these management of expectation issues. You will never be able to deliver according to expectation or even according to the mandate. But that's the, that's the business we're in. So I just wanted to make that, that additional point. Uh, his partial answer to your last point, Ambassador. Um, on your others, I think there were three I just want to quickly uh, touch upon. Uh, one, uh, and it's linked to also Anishashti's first question. Uh, why did the conflict shock all, slash, why didn't you prevent it from happening? Um, in all these different uh, um, statements on, on the crisis, I've always started, but I didn't think it was necessary here. This is a political crisis. 
nothing else. It's a political crisis that turned violent and that turned ethnic in sequence. It was not a deliberate ethnic conflict that had uh, a precursor or that had a scapegoat that was political. No, it was a political crisis that turned violent, that turned ethnic in sequence. And so I don't think it was a part of a grand strategy to kill a certain population, uh, either this way or that way. Um, it was basically something that happened by uh, the turn of events. And then uh, in different, more private fora, we can discuss what happened in those different stages and who and how did those things develop, uh, by whom and, and how. But I won't, uh, that's not for the, this audience, I believe. Um, linked to that, Anish Ashti, the, I think the, the mission, me, uh, a lot of people really, really engaged politically. I mean, you couldn't have, the, have had a political process that looked like a negotiation before there was an acknowledgement by parties that that was needed. I mean, the constraint any mediator has is that you have to deal with parties that need to talk. And the parties need to acknowledge that there's a problem to be willing to solve the problem. That's always the constraint of a mediator. So if you don't have the, either the invitation by the parties or you don't have a willingness to discuss openly what the problem is, you will not be able to do anything. So what happened, without going into too much detail, because that's also not for this forum, but since it's on a public forum. But what happened basically uh, was that, I mean, let me just take the archbishops. That's uh, probably the best example. Prior to the, uh, the, the sacking of the whole cabinet, including the vice president, the archbishops, um, this was in April, after the REAC was taken, the vice president, former vice president, was, his powers was, was, were reduced. Uh, there was a very, very significant outcry among the people. They were very, very worried that something would happen. So the archbishops went in together with Abla Lier, the former VP, and together with uh, the moderator of the Presbyterian Church, um, and they had a meeting with the vice president and the president. And they discussed with both of them, you know, we need to solve this issue. Uh, and they said, which issue? Um, and, and they said, everything is fine both of them, and everyone knew it was not fine, but there was no, yeah, I mean, there was really, you need to have a receptiveness on the side of the different parties engaged to be an effective mediator and to put a political process in place. Now, the additional issue related to that, I mean, with indiscreet, um, indiscreet uh, uh, meetings, there would be an admission, of course, privately, one-on-one, -on -one, later. But the, the, in addition to that and linked to that, the issue of, you know, normally a conflict is between parties. In the case of South Sudan, and in, in a government with a rebel gr group or something like that, in the case of this crisis, it was an internal party conflict. That makes it even more delicate. It's as if, you know, I would have, you know, in my party, those of our, who are Norwegian, you know, you had had somebody from the other country coming in and saying they want to negotiate. Some of you are so old. Between Kori Christian and Sinan Magne in 1981. Remember? I mean, a bit delicate, no? To have foreigners do that. So what I did was to try to push the SPLM process so that there were committees internally in the party. And they had always resolved. They've been through these crises numerous times. 2004. November, 2005, six, 2008 convention. I mean, those who are South Sudanese, I remember all of this. Multiple times, similar crisis, similar players, sometimes a blueprint on some of it. And they every time managed to solve the crisis at the last minute, quarter past 12, that's South Sudan. So I, knowing this and had monitored this for years, I thought, okay, so this is again, one of those moments, okay? So let's push for this committee to be to work, this internal party committee, have the leadership sorted out themselves. They will manage, they always did. But you know, what then made me really, really worried was the 6th of December press conference and the response on the 7th of December by the vice president. Because when parties go out in public, 
they can be less effective mediators internally in the party afterwards. So up to the 6th of December, I trusted that the party internal process in the party, I know the SPLM very well too, they usually sorted these things out every time, but at the last minute. So, so this was kind of, so I pushed for, you know, go, come on guys, you can fix this. So that's the way I did it with all these different leaders that I know. And I thought it would happen until they chose to, they both chose to go public. Then it was really, really hard to then have people that could go, because many of the ones that usually mediated in the past were the ones going public. And then suddenly a whole set of players that would normally solve the situation were, norm were then out, basically, of the process. That's when I understood, now it's going to happen. Something is going to happen. When? Scale? How? What? And I, you know, so it's not as if we didn't do anything. And no peacekeeping mission and SRSG could have resolved this in any other way, I have to say. Absolutely no way. They wouldn't have come halfway of what we tried to do because you need to know the players to really, need to know them extremely well to have an input into those delicate matters. So it's a little bit of a long answer, but I think it's important because this is a question that everybody has in their head. Why didn't, where wasn't it stopped? And of course, because of the international angle here, it was also better to use the parties, right? So the ANC came as a party in a party meeting with the SPLM. Because then it's a party party thing. It's a, it is in the, within the political realm, right? So it's easier for the comrades to help the comrades than some wazungu like me or somebody else coming from the outside, not knowing them, uh, etc. Um, then the issue, just very briefly, uh, who's being helped and, or not. Actually, we have still, I believe, um, close to 2,000 IDPs in WOW in the on this base they are newer who came who fled from mapel and went out and around and sought refuge because they're former security operations personnel and their families and they don't know where to go so the un is is helping everywhere and the un agencies of course if there is adequate numbers they will be there with humanitarian assistance as well so so this is a national task that we are taking on Finally, very briefly, uh, on the police issue, uh, just to say that the trust issue is acknowledged. The leadership and the police, as well as the government, do know, and they told me, and they have said it publicly, people, the IDPs, do not trust yet the police. Some do, but it's coming from the police themselves. So the IGP has developed something which is really, really, really good, which is the confidence and trust-building strategy of the police, of the SSMPS. This confidence building and trust building strategy is targeting the IDPs in Juba to foster their return. And it is dependent on UN support. So that is among the methods that we are using. It's true that more and more people are coming out, but still huge numbers remain. So for the large scale movement to happen, we need to see a, a larger sense of trust and a better sense of trust than we've seen so far. Einstein? Mm. Yes. Um, I think that uh, several of you have raised uh, the important issue of what should the UNAMIS do now. I'm a historian, so I, we believe that you have to wait 30 years until you have the answer <laughs> about what happened. <laughs> so meanwhile, I think we have to rely on Hilda and others that were inside during the process to see, uh, to try to analyze uh, those crucial days. But to come back to what Unimis can do, I, I, I must say that I was, I'm a little bit worried, especially wha by what uh, Petter said <laughs> uh, about this need for the UN to become uh, more active, to become more robust. And there are several reasons for this. One is that Hilde has been pointing to the point, uh, to, to the fact that they, uh, the unimis um, or, or the challenges in South Sudan was underestimated. But how was that possible when you had the unimis with one S going on for six years, doing exactly the same thing? How could, was it possible to underestimate when you had this six years of experience in South Sudan? Can we then expect that if we're now going in with a much more delicate operation, that they will not underestimate the problems again? I, I don't think, that, I think that uh, there is a huge underestimation of the problems that will, people will face. And I think the warnings from 
uh, Ambassador Bolweck should be well considered here. Normally, when, um, go, uh, when foreign interventions are coming into countries, they normally favor the government or the government side. And when the representative of the government say that, no, 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 you, sh you shouldn't do this, then, then you should listen. Because the point here is that it is extremely difficult to have a military, foreign military operation in uh, South Sudan. And what more is that you don't only endanger the mission, but you will endanger the whole international engagement in South Sudan. You can very easily end up with the situation that you have in Somalia, where all foreigners, everyone, are seen as the enemy to be kidnapped or to be assassinated, where it's impossible for anyone to do anything inside because the foreigners are seen as partial to the conflict. So far, we've been very fortunate in South Sudan, where foreigners are seen as helpers, as assisters, as facilitators. But if we start going in, shooting people uh, at a kind of operation-to-operation uh, -operation basis, that will change very quickly. Uh, so I, I think I want to use this opportunity with a very sincere warning uh, <laughs> against that direction. Can I make a little bit of a comment? Actually, we are Sorry. running out of time, and I have one more person on oh, my list. Fine. So I'll just hand you one. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Daniel Warjok, uh, former MP in South Sudan Legislative Assembly and former Minister of Education in Upper Nile State, and now representing the SPLM in opposition. Uh, I would first like to thank you, Madam Helder, for the good work that you have been doing. I've been very close to you right from the CPA era. Uh, I have also, during my days in Norway, I've been in Norway since 1985. So I'm very knowledgeable about the Norwegian uh, uh, environment. Uh, it is true what you have said. The war actually in South Sudan, which started again on the 15th of December, if the UNAMIS was not there, I don't think that we would be talking of handful of thousands kill or massacre in Juba. Because uh, we are actually talking in tune of over 20,000 Nuer civilian massacre in Juba by the government sponsored militias. They were trained, armed, and directed to do the killing. And they were using the government institution, like the police, to massacre civilian. So that one, there is no, there is no excuse about it. It is very sad. Uh, it was actually the, un, uh, the unamis that prevent the killing in a bigger number. As in other states, the unamis also did the same by giving protection to the civilian. Uh, but with the reason clutches in Malakal, the there is actually, uh, the security organ are also involved in, in uh, kidnapping the U U uh, NGOs workers who are actually from the Nuer. Uh, until the day, uh, four or five days ago, they took actually two people and they are still missing up to now. There was a fighting the day before yesterday and even yesterday among the civilian in the Unimis camp in Malakal, between the Shuluk and the Nuer. So that one, it actually needs more improvement because some elements who are actually working as a security guard, they used to betray or they used to call the security organ that somebody is actually going to the airport. And then once that person gets into the airport, then he's apprehended by the security. So it is very sad. But with the root causes of the conflict, as you put it also correctly, it has nothing to do with Dinka Nuer or tribal conflict. It was an SPLM concern. So 
And then the question is, if it was an SPLM matter, which was actually ignited by the, the SPLM members within the leadership, what made the government actually to take law into their hand and kill the civilian? And were specifically targeting only one group of people, the Nuer. Because Riek was not alone if there was actually any implication in the alleged coup, which was not actually the case. Riek was together with De uh, Rebecca Nyandeng from Dinka, with Deng Alor from Dinka, and then Pagana Mum from Shuluk. Why they did not kill the other twelve? What made them to kill only one twelve? That is actually the question. So now, the, 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 the matter is also getting even more complicated by inviting the foreign forces to South Sudan. For example, the president of Uganda forces, they are actually extended their presence up to the oil field in Greater Upper Nile. As we are speaking today, now, the fighting actually has been taking place for the last two days in Bentiu, in which Bentiu, for the, uh, about two, two to three hours ago, was captured by the opposition. So there is no hand to this cycle. The only problem, uh, the only solution to all these things is actually for foreign forces to get out from South Sudan and let the government also talk in good faith, instead of talking of uh, that, if, uh, if REAC or any group who rebel against the government wish to come back, then they should get a non-executive prime minister. Does it really make sense? So I think let us be honest to ourselves. The problem is not Norwegian. The problem is ourselves because we are not honest to ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. I know there are several people who would like to ask questions, but we are running out of time, so I'll ask Hilda Neisten to make some final comments. Yes. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> there was only one more question, actually. And uh, um, I, I think it kind of demonstrates uh, some of the tension that you find inside uh, South Sudan among the political elites. But it is interesting to see that there seems to be a somewhat overall agreement that this is a party issue. Um, so, um, uh, and again, uh, uh, I focus on uh, the fact that this is, uh, this is something that has to be solved by the South Sudanese, first and foremost. And, uh, that, uh, and this debate will go on for a long time, and I think I will give uh, Hilda the chance now to close the session. Thank you very much. Um, just very briefly, um, I think uh, on uh, the comment that Einstein made on, made on protection of civilians, I think what is the challenge for a mission uh, in a situation like this is that there is a very significant expectation in the population and in the Security Council for missions to act on the mandate of protection of civilians. Not understanding all the complexities. At the same time, I mean, if, if your view is to be taken as, as the view, then one has to acknowledge that the mission will not act in a number of situations and people will die. And so it's a very difficult uh, assessment to make. And I think if there is to be a reality in the protection of civilians' mandates, it have to, has to be acted upon. I think we need a clean, a clean guidance here. Either you have a POC mandate and you act or you don't and just cut out the POC and let them just be present with monitoring capacity. Because I think the, the, the challenge is going, is going to be whether, if you have a mandate that you cannot uh, act upon, you will be in an impossible situation. And, and I have been in numerous, numerous situations with South Sudanese shouting at me uh, and saying, why didn't you protect us in different intercommunal attacks uh, in the country? Uh, because they, they think that when we're there, that that's what we're gonna do. Um, when we don't really have the capacity to do so. So it's, it's, a, it's really impo important for any mission to have clarity. Uh, and then I think what we need is also for headquarters and the UN Security Council to back a mission when you're in a situation like this. 
is if they have given a mission a mandate, they have to give the SRSG and the mission the backing if something if it doesn't really go the way th that is expected. And then, of course, one needs to have very, very clear discussions with parties on the ground how the mandate is to be implemented and in which way. What can we expect if you do X, then Y is going to happen. What can you expect if you do Y, then X is going to happen. I think if we, that's what we also try to do in security discussions with the government at the time, because otherwise you will end up in impossible situations, as you likely point out. But I think the, the issue is clarity. Otherwise, you, you, you get in, into impossible uh, situations. Then um, most of this were, was comments. So the, um, the only other uh, point I, I wanted to, to make is basically it's important to, point, to, to, to acknowledge both sides' responsibility. Yeah? So you had uh, killings going on in Juba, but you've had terrible atrocities committed by the other side, partly as revenge, but also partly out of control. And so I think our human rights report documents equal, uh, equal responsibility, unfortunately, on both sides. What I find as a person who have been working with South Sudanese for so many years, the most kind of one of the most terrible things is that the usual rules or guidance and values that used to guide uh, conflict in South Sudan. Um, protection of women and children, for example, is ingrained in the Nilotic uh, culture. If you are going on a cattle raid, even with uh, huge numbers, you will not attack women and children. Um, and there are certain rules that have been taught to generations of South Sudanese. All of this is gone with this conflict. And so you've never seen this type of... I mean, it was always bad, but, but it really has been wiped out. And so that is, for me, really one of the, the, the most terrible things, is how can you start rebuilding some norms and some real values that can help South Sudanese going forward, not only in founding a new foundation, uh, not only to guide whatever is happening on the ground, but also you know, in rebuilding uh, the nation. It's going to be a huge challenge, but I do agree with all of those saying this is a South Sudanese. Can, they, they're, they're the ones that have to do it. Um, but of course, for the international community, uh, there are limits as to for how long can you watch people just, uh, you know, point fingers at each other without really solving the issue. So to some extent, my experience from the CPA negotiations, I think it's for Sudan as well as for South Sudanese, some of the same inherent, it takes a long time <laughs> for people to agree at the negotiating table and it takes a certain pressure. And so that, that is also necessary. So while the solutions have to be ingrained and generated from within, I think the tolerance levels for South Sudanese in terms of violence are much higher than those of international, in the international community. And I'm not saying this in any derogatory manner. I think the history uh, you've gone through, 50 years of civil war, I mean, this is more the norm, normality. Uh, peace is the exception. So, uh, you know, so when you're used to it, you have a certain higher level of tol tolerance. And I think we cannot, on behalf of women, children, and the population of South Sudan, tolerate this. And we need to push, therefore, for a quicker solution than what maybe uh, can, can come from within. If all the time is granted, uh, it can take a very, very long time, and you might not even have South Sudan left as a country. So that's why I think it's critical that, yes, it has to come from within, but we internationally have to, to really push. Otherwise, um, it can go the wrong way. I think that was my last word. I think that's a thank good, you. good place to end this. Uh, all that remains is to thank you for showing up and to thank uh, Hilda Neisten for illuminating us and uh, <laughs> providing such an interesting discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs>